Hello and welcome back to Crack NCA Exams. Today we are studying Foundations of Canadian Law and we are studying Chapter Number 5 which is Parliament and its Components. Let's have an introduction towards the Canadian Parliament. The Canadian Parliament consists of three parts. The Sovereign, which is represented by the Governor-General, the Senate and the House of Commons. Each of these components play a crucial role in the structure and the operation of the Canadian Parliament. The monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, not in the element anymore, and is now king, Charles III, is the head of the state. However, in practice, the Governor General exercises the monarch's power. The monarch's role has been challenged in legal cases such as O'Donoghue versus the Queen and McAteer versus Canada Attorney General. The spellings of these cases are O D O N O H U E versus the Queen, and the second case is McAteer versus Canada, which is M C A T E E R versus Canada. In case you're interested in reading these cases, these cases have established the importance of the Queen's role in Canadian constitutional framework and the continuity of Canada. Uh, and the continuity of Canada's form of government. When it comes to the selecting of Governor General, there is a mix of constitutional conventions, traditions and practical considerations. The Prime Minister plays a crucial role in the selection process by recommending a candidate to the monarch. There are some established conventions that guide the process, such as the candidate being a Canadian citizen and the position altering and the position alternating between Anglophone and Francophone appointees. Now let's just quickly discuss the article by Luke Beck, The Role of Religion in the Law of Succession in Canada and Australia. It's a fascinating topic that intertwines the realm of monarchy, religion and constitutional law across different Commonwealth countries. We'll be discussing the religious tests governing the royal succession in the United Kingdom and how these tests interact with the constitutional provisions of Canada and Australia. At the heart of our discussion is a critical examination of the assumption that the monarchies of Commonwealth realms such as Canada and Australia are governed by the same rules as a British monarchy. This assumption is challenged in the article we are discussing today. Historically, various religious tests determine who could ascend to British crown. These tests rooted in religious dogma, essentially mandated by, uh, essentially mandated that only Protestants could become monarchs. While recent changes have relaxed some of these rules, the core religious tests remain. Now let's discuss the Canadian and Australian constitutional prohibitions on religious tests. Both Canada and Australia have constitutional provisions that touch upon religious freedoms. In Canada, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees freedom of conscience and religion, which extends to immunity from religious tests for holding public office. Australia's constitution, on the other hand, explicitly prohibits religious tests for holding any public office at the federal level. What's the monarch's role in Canada and Australia now? The monarch plays a pivotal role in both countries' constitutional structures. While in Canada, the monarch is deeply embedded in the executive and the legislative processes. Australia's relationship with the monarchy has evolved over time, reflecting its journey towards greater independence. Now let's discuss the royal succession laws. The crux of this article revolves around the laws of royal succession in both countries. In Canada, while the religious tests governing UK's royal succession seems inconsistent with the Canadian Charter, they are not directly subject to it. In Australia, the article suggests that the uh, uh, religious rules governing the royal succession might be invalidated by the Australian Constitution Section 116. To wrap up, this article underscores the need for Commonwealth realms to reconsider the religious tests governing the royal succession. It advocates for these countries to align their constitutional provisions with the modern-day values and realities of national sovereignty. This topic serves as a reminder of the integrate interplay between historical traditions, religious beliefs and evolving constitutional frameworks. It's a testament to the dynamic nature of law and its ability to adapt and reflect societal changes. Moving on, now let's discuss the Senate. 
The Senate, as the upper house of Canada's federal legislature, consists of appointed members who serve up until the age of 75. The Governor-General appoints senators based on the advice of the Prime Minister. Over the years, there have been legal challenges and controversies related to appointment process, as well as recent attempts to reform the Senate as well. However, significant reform has proven challenging due to the need for the consent from a majority of the provinces. Now let's discuss the last article of this chapter, which is from Joel Colonroy, I hope I Colonroy, and Alan C. Hutchinson. I hope I pronounced their respective names correctly or as close as possible. Uh, the article is Constitutionalizing the Senate, a Modest Democratic Proposal. This article is from the year 2015. This is a really insightful article that delves into Canadian Senate's role and challenges the proposal surrounding its reform. The article kicks off by addressing the Canadian Senate's current structure and its operational challenges. The authors present a compelling argument, which is the Senate and as it stands has issues, but there is a potential solution. They suggest reconvening the Senate's role, making it a constitutional reviewer. The idea is rooted in the principle of democratic pragmatism, which aims to bolster the democratic legitimacy of the constitutional system. The impasse of this article is, historically, the Senate being the upper chamber of Canada's bicameral, bicameral parliament has, the, uh, has been a topic of debate and numerous reform proposals. The author sheds light on Senate's historical significance and its evolving role within the Canadian political framework. Did you know that the Constitution Act of 1982 does not have just one rule for constitutional amendments? This multifaceted approach isn't unique to Canada. The authors drew parallels with other countries like US, emphasizing the intricacies of these amendment processes. Now let's discuss how this article talks about basic structures and democracy. One of the article's core discussion revolves around the idea of constitution's basic structure. This represents the foundational commitments of a constitutional regime. Countries like Canada, Spain and India, despite their differences, share common ground in their constitutional values, with democracy being a pivotal element. Now let's move on to the next part of the article, which is upper houses and their legitimacy. Historically, upper houses have been viewed with a certain level of skepticism. They, are, they were often perceived as mechanisms to protect the interests of a select few. However, the authors discuss the evolution of the democratization of these houses, emphasizing the need for them to be more aligned with democratic principles of the modern era. Now coming back to Senate as a reviewer, here is where the article presents a novel idea. What if the Senate's primary role was to review the constitutionality of bills proposed by the House of Commons? This approach, the authors argue, could revitalize the Senate, making it a more effective institution that contributes positively to the democratic process. The authors reiterate the urgency of Senate reform. They acknowledge the challenges but remain optimistic. They advocate for innovative solutions rooted in democratic values to enhance the constitutional order's legitimacy. I hope this brought you some clarity on the articles and the case laws. They have just been added to the syllabus. If you are looking at more detailed versions of these ones, like I mentioned in my previous class as well, they are available on my website with my notes. And the notes are most updated and more detailed than what I'm discussing here in these classes. If you're interested, check it out. The link's in the description below. In the next class, we will move on to the functions of parliament. So, I will see you in the next class.